Next up is Ryan Hiles. Ryan. Um, Ryan is our New Mexico State Apiary Instructor, um, a great friend to NBKA. I'm really glad he could be here today. And if you didn't see those really cute little backpacks at his table, you've got to see them. So, Ryan is going to talk to us a little bit about beekeeping in New Mexico. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to get up here every year and uh, talk to you guys about what we're seeing out there, what we're finding, and, and what we're doing. Um, our bee program is relatively small to the New Mexico Department of Agriculture, but we, we try our best to keep it alive and, and find what funding sources we can to, to continue our, our progress in some of the, the research. And, uh, that we need to do to see what's affecting our apiary industry in the, in the state. A few of our goals, uh, basically, we want to develop education for uh, pollinator protection, get that uh, out there, get practices put together that farmers can use, uh, local and state agencies, um, basically anybody, homeowners, Anything anybody can use to, to promote the health of uh, pollinators in the state. Um, we want to ensure that we get positive relations between all these groups. If, if we don't have a good working relationship between each of the groups, they tend to kind of cut off, put off, put on the blinders, and, and not not really pay attention to what, to what other groups need. So we, if we can maintain those relationships, we uh, have a better outcome in the end. Um, Big thing we want to do is push bee-friendly plants. Um, kind of as we go through the data, one of the factors that we see possibly uh, hindering bee health in New Mexico is um, not having enough forage, not having enough food out there for bees to eat. Uh, if we can increase that and let people plant, that'll definitely be a help. Um, and then, of course, we want to uh, just make more people aware of bees and what their, their benefits are. And, uh, increase awareness of uh, the program we have that we'll talk about later, the, the Bee Watch program that uh, pesticide applicators can use, farmers can use, uh, to know where there's, if, there, if there's beehives in the area before they end up in application. So just getting into uh, some of the losses we're seeing, kind of as a background, um, in the U.S., as far as a region, we're, this is based off of 2014-2015 data that um, apiaries reported themselves to the Be Informed Partnership. Um, as you can see, one good thing, we're in a region with uh, the lowest uh, losses. We're still not at the point that we want to be, uh, considering these numbers. Uh, that's probably about, that's about 30 32%, I think, is what it worked out to. Um, we want to see below 15%, ideally. Um, but we are in a region that, that can support that, uh, can support bees and, and minimize bee losses. Um, if we move into New Mexico, uh, we can take a look at our specific numbers for that 2014-2015 reporting period. Um, from what you guys reported, uh, total number of colonies managed was close to 2,000. Um, obviously, there's a lot more colonies than that out there. This is just people that, that responded to the survey. Um, our average colony loss was around 30%, about twice of, twice of what we want to see. So, um, so what's what's causing bee loss in New Mexico? Um, if I can get, get you guys to throw some ideas at, at me, what, what you guys think is the biggest uh, cause to, to be lost in New Mexico, we can, can go from there. Anybody have any ideas? Poor nutrition and bias. I'm sorry? Poor nutrition, lack of forage, uh, and virus, vector, Okay, poor nutrition, lack of forage, and parasites, rural plants, basically. Um, that's pretty good indicator. Have another? Chemicals. 
chemicals. Another another good, really big consideration um, for our study and what we wanted to determine is uh, what's going on there. Um, as you can see in this slide, it's just showing you a bunch of ideas of what could affect uh, bee health. Uh, we have our external pesticides, um, lack of nutrition, viruses, uh, our mites that usually transmit those viruses, um, possibly could be in hive pesticides, um, and then our pathogens. Uh, all factors that combined or by themselves can, can prohibit the, the health of a hive. So in 2015, um, we decided to start back up with the, the Honey Bee Health Survey. Uh, USDA put out some funding, or they had advertised some funding for state agencies. Um, we decided to jump on board, uh, take a hold of that. It, it was something they hadn't offered for, for a few years, and we definitely knew it was a, a big and upcoming issue in the state. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to determine what pests we might have affecting these apiaries and uh, build a data set that our legislators could, could use to uh, make their decisions in, in various rules and, and regulations and come up with new laws or if necessary or uh, new ideas to promote the health of, of uh, apiaries. We took a look at 24 apiaries um, we have a preliminary uh, pesticide analysis of the comb. Uh, I say it's preliminary. We want to run it a second time, uh, see if we get anything uh, new out of that same comb from 2015. Um, we did completed a virus and disease analysis and then a par parasite analysis. Um, moving into probably what everybody's most interested about is uh, the pesticide analysis. This is one thing we can probably easiest is easiest to control out there uh, if we did have an issue. Um, the results we came back with were, were relatively interesting. Um, the active ingredient we found, uh, spiromesophen, we did find in most all of the apiaries surveyed. I think there was only one or two apiaries that didn't have uh, significant amounts of spiromesophen. Um, this was also the only active ingredient that was uh, found in any reportable quantities. Uh, just a little background on what what's considered a, a reportable quantity. Um, basically, our state chemist identifies a reportable quantity as uh, 10 parts per billion. Uh, with new technology, it's possible to pretty much find anything in any in any substance. 10 parts per billion, just to give you a, an idea of what a part per billion is, is basically a penny out of $10 million is, is what that works out to. Um, so what is spiromesphere? We're seeing this in most of the hives. We're, we're definitely concerned about chemicals or, or pesticides being an issue. Um, we, we dug into this very deeply. Uh, it's a miticide is our first uh, clue there with, with a low toxicity of bees. It's primarily labeled for uh, mites, white flies, uh, and corn production. There are labels, however, for um, ornamental and turf applications. Uh, these ornamental and turf applications, however, the products labeled for, the, for those type of applications are extremely expensive compared to other products that may be used for, for that same uh, issue that they, they may be having. So we don't see it as uh, a high likelihood that on and turf uh, applicators are using the product. Um, we did come across data uh, basically put in calls to, to many of the our uh, other our state agencies in other states. Uh, came across an instance in uh, Florida that they uh, ran into about three or four years ago. Uh, they had apiaries using uh, spiromesophen as a miticide to control their burrow mites in their hive. Uh, they, my understanding is they later studied that 
uh, they didn't find necessarily ill effects from the people using this pyromycephate, but they didn't find any benefits to actually eliminating the, the viral bites either. Uh, so where, where we're looking now is, we're curious, might this be an unlisted active ingredient in some of our treatments or, or medications that we're using uh, from foreign sources. Uh, we don't know really what's being used out there, and that's really a project that we're going to want to focus on uh, coming up over the next year. See if we can narrow down where this spiral mesophyte is coming from. Uh, except the fact that many of the apiaries surveyed uh, were not close to cornfields, and the low likelihood of this product being used in um, watermelon turf applications really has us baffled at this point. So moving into our disease and virus uh, results, keep in mind these are 2015 um, results. We've also pretty much completed a, a 2016 survey, although some of the results are still going in from that. Um, in 2015 we had nine diseases. Uh, that we found across the, the state. I'm not going to rattle them off for, for you, but as you can see, there's all the different diseases we found. Um, however, deformed wing virus we found in every apiary. Uh, this is commonly known to be transmitted by varroa mite, so it wasn't a big surprise that we found that across, across the board. Um, moving into parasites. Uh, Biggest surprise to us, really, the, the levels of varroa mites we were seeing throughout the state. Uh, our mite levels exceeded uh, the USDA recommended threshold in 90% of the apiary survey. Uh, out of that, those same apiaries, about 70% of those apiaries had mite levels greater than 80% of all the hives surveyed in the, across the U.S. So basically, we were in the top 20% of uh, hives surveyed for our varroa mite counts, which is really not a, a good thing at all. Um, so just a little tip, I think this is really something that uh, in cooperation with the beekeepers, they, they, they put on a, a training earlier in the year uh, for you guys to show up and, and take a look at how to, how to survey for varroa mites. Uh, we think that's really the, the way to go, that it seems to have shown a benefit. It will, it will show you in some of the 2016 results. Um, but the big thing is just be out there, dig into your hive. Um, there's hundreds of videos online. Uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics of how to, how to actually do a, a survey, uh, but the, the sugar roll method is probably the most common, uh, easiest to do, and, and least invasive to the bees. Um, just want to keep an idea out of about 300 bees if in April and May, that's what's coming up soonest, uh, we see two to three mites for your sample. We probably want to start thinking about treatments. Um, coming into June and July, if we're seeing 10 mites, uh, that's about the, where we want to look at the treatments. And then where we're most concerned about uh, before we're going into, or we really want to have a strong hive before we're going into winter, uh, we want to make sure that there's uh, less than 10 to 12 mites per, per sample when you take that sample. Uh, then we want to move on to determining the treatment uh, and ensure we monitor post-treatment to see if that treatment's working. What we see happen a lot out there is we'll get people to, they'll go treat and then they might not look at their results afterwards, they just assume that the treatment worked. Uh, a lot of times it hasn't. We may need to look at a, a different treatment. Um, this is relatively hard to see, but um, North Carolina State University, they have this uh, handy kind of cheat sheet for uh, treatments. They have up here your kind of your mechanical methods, um, your screen bottom board. Uh, these help, they're just not the most effective uh, way of getting rid of mites. Uh, we can move into some of our more organic uh, materials like our inert dust. Um, 
they have a little bit better uh, effectiveness, and then we get into all the various actual registered products to use in a hive that, that tend to show a high efficacy uh, for controlling the role. And just again, to, to hammer this home, monitor after your treatment. Uh, even though you may be using one of these products that have a high uh, effective rate, it's not guaranteed that they'll work. A lot of times we get grow mites that uh, build up resistance to certain products that we need to rotate as well. Um, so moving into our 2016 survey, um, I know some of you may have seen Tyler out there knocking on your door, uh, taking a look at, at your hives. Um, what we did come up with, uh, we've seen a decrease in uh, our varroa mite levels. We only had 30% of the apiaries that were over uh, the threshold, the SDA recommended threshold. Uh, it's hard to compare it to our 2015 results in, in the, the surveys, AD, or the apiary survey were different apiaries, but we do believe that the outreach that the beekeepers provided and, and those training uh, sessions really uh, helped increase the awareness of the Varroa mite and has helped bring those levels down. Um, in turn, we also had a, a significant decrease in, in diseases as well. So what are, our, what are our future ideas? Where are we going from here? Well, we I hope to have it together before this meeting, but I, I didn't have enough time, unfortunately. We're going to put together an online survey um, with the help of the New Mexico beekeepers, hopefully we'll put it up on their uh, website if, if they uh, deem it acceptable in way. Um, we want to determine basically, if we can, what products are being used, uh, whether there's medications or treatments. What, basically, we're trying to find anything that's being put into your hive. We really want to narrow down this uh, source of the spiral mesophyte. Um, like I said earlier, it may be a product that, or an active ingredient that's not listed on the label of uh, some products out there. We, we really don't know. We're still kind of in the dark is where that's coming from. Um, we have plans to continue with a 2017 Honeybee Health Survey. Um, by the looks of it, this will be a similar survey to 2015 and 2016. We'll look at another 24 apiaries. Uh, we're waiting on confirmation of funding through USDA and Farm Bill for that survey. However, uh, what's interesting to, to see in 2017 is they've taken the idea um, that we had as a state uh, in basically using comb and, and bees for, for pesticide residue analysis, and they're applying that across the country for, for every sample that's going to be sent in. We're going to continue our drift watch programs. I haven't talked about this very much, but I have a couple slides in a minute that will give you some data on, on those programs. Um, and we want to develop just educational materials, pamphlets that we can hand out, uh, possibly some student education programs if, if we get some funding. We've applied for another grant uh, through USDA strictly for outreach and education, uh, which we're going to put a lot of uh, APR thoughts into along with our other recent pest issues. Um, and another goal that we have every year seems to keep, we keep striving for it, but we haven't been able to get there yet, was to develop some best management practices um, that we can get out to beekeepers, uh, farmers, and, and pesticide applicators out there. Um, ideally, if we can increase pollinator protection across the state, uh, we're going to be doing our job. That's, uh, that's our big goal. Uh, we just want to make sure there's good communication, like we mentioned earlier, between beekeepers, uh, custom applicators. These will be your applicators spraying for farms or local areas, and then our, our neighborhood growers. Uh, get them planting bee friendly plants uh, to hopefully give us some better forage for. We move into our, our drift watch program. Uh, if you haven't looked yet, uh, I know probably most of you have, but 
uh, most of our response and, and uh, participation is from the beekeepers, which is really great. Um, it's also called Bee Watch. They'll, they'll lead basically to the same site. Uh, this allows you to basically put your name. I'm missing a slide here. Let you put your name on a in into a program. Um, and it'll put you as a, basically a dot on, on New Mexico's map. Uh, the pesticide applicators can get on there and take a look at. They can see where there's a bee hive in the area. Um, contact you before they're going to make a, an application if, it, if the product they're using uh, may require movement of a hive uh, just to protect it or anything like that. Um, and overall, well, there's a there's the time. So, you can see it, it can be used to, a lot of times. We get our organic farmers also using this. Uh, this is of Colorado. I, I thought I had to make it. Um, there's more points up there. Bees for the uh, the beehives, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, just other organic crops. If you do any other other crops, you can list those in there too. If you want to keep them organic. So lastly, we really want to move into a few considerations that uh, we've had for over the past few years. Um, st we're still looking at registration for non-commercial apiaries. Right now, our state program basically consists of registration for uh, commercial apiaries, which at this point, I think in 2017, we have four commercial apiaries registered. Um, that's not a clear and concise representation of the aviary industry in New Mexico. It's a, a relatively small uh, subset of that. Uh, what this registration does is it, it allows us as a state to know where there's hives if we do have a, a pest outbreak or, or a disease outbreak. Um, it allows us to exclude or, or basically block off new pests if they're coming in. Uh, by knowing those locations, we can inform uh, growers or apiaries that may be closest to that that uh, this is coming to keep an eye out. Uh, this also helps provide justification to keep our state apiary program. Uh, right now with the, the four commercial uh, apiaries that we have registered, I think our, our program is being funded at about four to six hundred dollars a year. Uh, the rest of that money is being pulled out of uh, state or federal grants, and it's just not really. It, it's barely trying to swing to keep the keep its uh, keep the program alive. Um, and then again, the more people we have involved, uh, the better we can provide apiary programs and, and, and do more outreach. Um, just in kind of wrapping things up, I'd like to thank uh, especially the New Mexico Beekeepers Association for uh, helping us get that um, apiary survey completed, uh, providing probably most of the outreach that, that goes on out there, uh, definitely doing the, the grow my training programs. Uh, it's just been a a significant resource to the apiary industry that uh, as the State Department of Agriculture and the, the resources we have, there's no way that uh, we could have done the work that you guys do that. That's about it. Any questions or anything? Talk about it. Um, I don't want to uh, steal the thunder from tomorrow, but um, basically, it's a. I'll start off with it. It's a labeling program um, that the kids the, with the Wild Friends um, are doing in cooperation with some of our uh, local nursery industry uh, growers. 
And basically what they're going to be looking at is identifying uh, plants that are pollinator friendly uh, and developing a label for those plants so that they can put them in stores and, and uh, essentially when a homeowner or somebody goes into that store they can say, oh this, hopefully the, the intention anyway is to get them to say, oh this plant is good for bees, let's buy this instead of another plant that's possibly not. Um, I'm not sure how deep they're going to get into it. Uh, there's the possibility of maybe a, putting like a time frame or a period of the year that that plant's friendly to bees so uh, homeowners can maybe go buy multiple different plants that will provide forage across the entire year for uh, bees and pollinators. And that's kind of the, the quick one minute synopsis of it. Uh, really been a big thing that, that Wild Friends has been spearheading and uh, just we've pretty much been able to provide the contact for the nursery industry that was the, the reason uh, hopefully help out with some ideas that they can do. Um, now for Drift Watch, really if any uh, pesticide applicator can use the program. Uh, they, we cannot require them to use the program, unfortunately, is the, uh, the idea behind that. Uh, Driftwatch won't allow uh, their program to be used for a regulatory uh, type effort. Uh, it's just a, an aid that they, that they develop. They don't want to get wrapped up in, in lawsuits or this or that. They won't allow us to, to make it a requirement as far as that would be Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if you have a strong form of action, but do you have ever looked at wild sterile colonies and see how they're doing? We have a source of potentially genetic. Right. No, I guess the, general, the big general answer is no. We have looked at um, some concerns of finding feral colonies um, like two or three years ago um, when we had a, a small hive beetle uh, show up down in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, we looked for feral colonies, but it hasn't been a concerted effort to, to go look for those colonies in the it has not. We're, we're pretty much limited to our, our commercial uh, site of the commercial regulatory site of the Yes? Is there any possibility Drift Watch could expand? I think right now they have a half acre from where you, uh, you locate your acre. A good example is I live next to uh, my next door neighbor is one of the biggest uh, uh, app commercial applicators, probably in the central part of the state. And uh, I know he doesn't look at Drift Watch because <laughs> he sprays all day long and never tells me that. Uh, uh, and I, I think it, since there's no regulatory authority, what would be wrong with expanding that? I'm, you know, I'm not sure that there there would be anything wrong with that. I don't know if the, uh, unfortunately it's not our section that, that pays for the program. We don't have the money for it. It's the pesticide uh, regulatory group. Uh, I don't know if it's a constraint that they they can change inside of the program or if it's just part of the, the program, but I can definitely bring that thought up to them and see what they have to say. Is it really? The last suggestion was to me that I go ahead and I, uh, I put multiple acres on my acreage okay. you know, along the perimeter. But uh, that's the you know, just time consuming. It's a lot easier. And I, I think their big thing is just wanting to verify that, uh, say, we're not putting an apiary just out in the middle of somewhere just to prevent an application from going on there. Uh, but I think it might be uh, there might be a possibility that if we can uh, show that it, basically in your instance that's your property, I think they could probably do something to get that completely out of it. Wouldn't be necessarily 
half of a dollar across the side. Across the yes, ma'am. Well, could they be able to rule out the possibility that the spiromethacin in wax foundation is, is the source? Uh, I guess I'm not I'm not really clear on, on that. as far as the spiral mesothin, um it was showing up in uh, in basically each of our comb samples. I'm not uh, I'm not sure as far as a lot of the wax foundation is contaminated for a long time. Now. I don't know if the industry is filtering it better, and maybe that's the only thing that's individual now. I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything about the industry, but that has been a significant source of miticide residue in the comb that they draw out from that foundation that is related to brood mortality. Correct. Um, it, it is, and that, that's essentially why we focused on, on trying to pull that. Uh, all, all of our samples were pulled directly from the hive, um, so they haven't been processed or in, anything in that instance. Uh, as far as the effects of spiral mesothin on, uh, on the, the hive itself, we don't know what those effects are, to be, uh, to be honest. But what we went off of was some word of mouth from from the state apiary uh, inspectors in, in Florida that did a little bit of a study on that. Um, but no, we, we, we took the comb samples just because they, we thought they would give us basically, we figured about a seven year period of what may have been picked up uh, from that hive, if, if that hive has survived that long, obviously. Um, Spiral my skin was still the only thing that I hope that answers your question better. It, it, I'm not looking like it does. <laughs> is, is that particular uh, miticide being used on alfalfa? I'm trying to remember. I don't think it's labeled for alfalfa. Uh, that's not to say it right. can't be. Or that, not to say that it isn't. Uh, by law it can't be. But I don't think it's labeled for alfalfa. Um, I, my hive was tested positive for spir spiromes. How do you say it? Spiromesophen. 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 And um, the outside, when he took a swab off the outside of the hive, that tested positive as well. Um, does that indicate that maybe it's more environmental than uh, just say pollen or nectar coming from plants that maybe? Uh, GMO. Or, I mean, is it possible that it's a that's something that's been in a GMO plant? You know, it, it's different. There's a possibility. Uh, we can't say that, that it is. That's why, uh, kind of, in our 2015 results, those were still preliminary results. We're still calling them preliminary results. Um, our big source uh, for those not being what we would say complete is we. In rerunning those samples, we want to determine if there's possibly any anything else, whether it be some kind of substance coming from a G GMO that basically mimics that mimics spiromesophen uh, in the machines picking it up. Um, I'd say it's probably not likely, but there, it is definitely a possibility. Something we want to figure out. Um, another possibility is being on the outside of the hive. It could be from the bees walking on the hive itself. Um, whether we pulled it from inside the hive or from an external source, we don't we don't know that. That's, that's where we're we're having a, a problem narrowing that down. It's just that when they say low toxicity, they that is we know that these low level exposures, especially to brood, you know can be a problem. It may not be high toxicity to the adult bee, but in essence, it can kill them out because it shortens the lifespan, you know, it affects clean fertility, etc. So, so I don't like them. No, <laughs> they say, oh, it's just low toxicity. And that, they that, never specific about what life stage we're talking about. You're absolutely right in, 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 in having the concern. That, and that's that's exactly why we want to figure where it's coming from. We, when they do these uh, 
acutely toxic tests, they're basically doing the test from the standpoint that the product is being used in the manner it's, it's labeled for, say if it was on corn, um, if the bees were out there flying through the corn, what is it going to do to it? Uh, no, the studies don't go into the, unfortunately, they don't go into the hive uh, to see what they would do to the brood or, or anything like that. Um, and unfortunately, not knowing where it's coming from, we don't know where to stop it at. Uh, and one of our big concerns is that it's not coming from an external source so much as possibly being added into a product that, that we're not being notified of. It's being put into the hive, uh, which would be even worse than it's being picked up by the bees out there. And we do know of a company out of California that was shut down uh, many years ago for putting spiromyscine in their products. Uh, we're wondering if this company is just moving overseas and uh, possibly putting it in their products or if it's in maybe some paints we're using for the, the highs. If we, we really, we're really in the dark about where it's coming from. If we can figure that out, we can hopefully get it out of the inside. Is there any uh, concern by NMDA about glyphosate in this state? Glyphosate, it, it, there's a concern about all pesticides through, through the Department of Agriculture. We have a, a whole section that regulates uh, pesticides and, and the proper use of pesticides uh, to kind of preface that. Um, from the results that we found uh, through our survey, uh, the good thing is, it doesn't seem to be that we're sh seeing glyphosate show up in our comb samples. Um, this year, we're, we do have bees from each of the eight areas that we surveyed uh, that were collected. Those bees are also going to be run for pesticide uh, residue to, to see if anything picks up on those. That would give us a better idea of maybe what's not accumulating in the hive or what they may be running into uh, as they're flying around out there. Um, but at this initial point, glyphosate doesn't seem to be getting into the comb of the honey. But are they testing the honey samples? Because that's where it's showing up. Honey is definitely a, another step to, to take a look at. Um, pretty much if it, from a lot of the studies, if it shows up in the, the honey, it should show up in the comb. Um, we haven't extracted honey for, uh, strictly by itself, but the comb samples that we have pulled have oftentimes had honey 